This morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is, is where we'll start. And uh, it's good to see everybody here uh, this morning. Looking forward to uh, being in the Lord's house or hearing from His Word. I'm excited about uh, excited about the messages. I always am, I guess. I just, I don't know why I always say that, because I always am excited about the messages and, and uh, what the Lord's doing. Um, but last night, I was laying in bed at 1030, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a good bedtime, right, 1030, and so... I'm sitting there and uh, just looking at the ceiling, and I told my wife, I said, I, I'm not going to be able to go to sleep. And uh, there's a couple of things on, on a couple of the messages that the Lord is working in my heart. And uh, I decided, well, I'll just get up early and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll know what to do and I'll, I'll type those things in or I'll, you know, change, <clears throat> not change, just add to and, and uh, sat there for a few more minutes. I said, well, I'm just going to get up. And uh, sometimes that's just the way it is as a pastor. <laughs> you just... And so I got up and uh, worked pretty early, we'll just say. And so uh, anyway, one of those kind of nights. And I just, uh, it's just because the, the Lord, when he, when he puts a burden on your heart, um, and, and there's just a lot there, and uh, sometimes a, a, a sleepless Saturday night's a good thing. And so anyway, pray for me, but I'm, do, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, man, I had coffee. It's thank the Lord for coffee uh, in all its forms. I'm very excited about that, and uh, so anyway, didn't say that to draw a pity party. I just said that to say I'm excited about the messages today. I have been for several hours now, so uh, anyway. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, uh, looking at the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit here on uh, in Sunday school. We've been doing this for a few lessons now, lesson 5 here. It's kind of a continuation of what we talked about last time, if you if you remember uh, we were talking about how the, the Holy Spirit of God calls us into His service and, and how that calling is not just for the pastor or for a full-time ministry, but everyone uh, who has been saved has uh, then been called to serve the Lord in some capacity. And I recognize that that capacity is different for, I mean, every person. Uh, they're, they're, I do believe that the Lord's still calling people into full-time ministry and, uh, and so I, I hope and I pray that when that calling is going forth, that people are responding and answering. Uh, but if the Lord has called you to a different place of service, serve Him there, um, because He has called you to serve. That is the, and it's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the whole point of it was, that's the point of our existence. That's the point of our life, is to glorify God. Um, and so there's all these worldly things we can give our, our time and attention to, but at, at the end of the day, when we when we do uh, receive that mansion in heaven, it won't be about what we did here for us and for this world. It'll be what we did for the cause of Christ. I think it was, uh, was it C.T. Studd that wrote that po poem, Only What's Done for Christ Will Last? I think that is C.T. Studd's poem. And it's very good. It's, it's exactly right. Um, we get all crazy about the things of this world. And our focus is here many times. Um, and, and I think there's some part of that that we're never going to be able to detach from until we're with the Lord. But I'm telling you, only what we do for the Lord will really per persist and last into eternity. So we've talked about this, this calling of the Holy Spirit. And then last week's lesson really looked a little bit at the empowerment of the Spirit as well. Um, but today we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit enables us. And it, it really is this idea that if the Lord calls us to do something... He will empower us and enable us to do it. In other words, He's not going to ask us to do something that He's not going to... It may be something that's bigger than us, we'll see that, but, but He's not going to give us something to do that is, is something we can't do with His help and with His empowerment. So look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2, and let's look at verse number 3 together. <clears throat> Actually, just, just... I mean, it's kind of weird to start on verse 3. Let's just start on verse 1, okay? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So you see Paul's coming into, he's writing this letter back to Corinth, and he's speaking of the time he was there. And he says, you know, when I came, I, I didn't, I, here's what he's saying, I came preaching the gospel. That's what I came, that was my message. Now, verse 3, 
This is the, remember who's speaking. This is the Apostle Paul. Okay, this is the guy that started all those churches, that took all those missionary journeys, that wrote most of the New Testament. He says this, And I was with you in weakness. Now, when we think about Paul, do we think of weakness? I mean, I don't. When I imagine Paul, I just imagine this hero of the faith that was um, a strong uh, Christian, uh, a leader, and, and uh, evangelist. But he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Have you ever thought about the Apostle Paul being fearful? I mean, they stoned him in one place. He got up and just went to the next place and preached again. I just never imagined that. But he's, he's sharing his heart here. He was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. He says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit's serving ministry this morning. Let's pray together. Ask the Lord to bless our time in Sunday school. Lord, we are so thankful to be in your house. And this morning, Lord, I do pray that you would um, help us by your Spirit to understand what your Word is telling us today. And then, Lord, help us to take what we learn from your Word and apply it to our lives this week, this day, uh, that we might be a, a testimony for you, that we might make a difference in our, uh, as we sang here, here this morning, in the areas where we're able to shine, we want to make a difference. And so, Lord, I pray that your Word would be effectual, help us, change us, mold us and make us to exactly what you'd have us to be. Lord, chip away at our rough edges and draw us close to you today. I pray you give me the words to say and help me to understand the things uh, that I've studied and that are in your word. And, and, and Lord, help me to just be, be focused. I, I believe I have thoughts from all three messages on my heart, and I just pray you'd help me to be focused so that, uh, Lord, you can clearly speak your word here. And uh, so, Lord, I pray for the words to say. Bless our, our Sunday school hour and also bless the kids and the youth that are downstairs and, and, and bless their teachers. And I just pray that those, those little kids and, and those young people would learn and uh, that, you know, that your word would be making a difference and an impact in their life as well this morning. Well, thank you for all that you do. We ask this in Jesus name. Amen. OK, so we'll talk about this first. The Holy Spirit empowers us. Holy Spirit empowers us. And I think I talked about this last week about how. I went through this, uh, this uh, transformation uh, when I became a pastor from on one day knowing everything to the next day knowing nothing. I think I explained that last week about how, you know, before I was a pastor, I thought, well, yeah, I know how to do that. I, and, I, and I was maybe even critical and I would do it this way. I would do it that way. Uh, but then the, the, the next day, it seemed as, as I kind of woke up to the realization that, oh, the Lord has made you a pastor now. These things are actually now your responsibility. All of a sudden, I knew nothing. And I felt incredibly inadequate for the ministry. And by the way, still do. Um, because the ministry, and, and, and so I have a quote here. I don't know who said it, but he said, if you don't feel inadequate for the ministry, you are either prideful or delusional. Because the ministry is bigger than we are. It, it requires more of us. This whole series is called um, Living Beyond Your Capacity. So that means you have a certain capacity. Uh, there's a certain amount of things you can do and a certain amount of effect you can have and a certain amount of ministry maybe that, that you could do. But, but God is saying, I'm going to stretch you beyond your capacity. I, I'm going to allow you to do more and, and more than you ever thought you could do. And it's not by your own power. It's, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, and, and it's not just for ministry people. I want to be clear. Um, you know, if you sign up to teach a Sunday school class, you'll be excited about it. And I, but, but I mean, when those little kids are looking at you and you guys, you got something to say, teacher, you got something that'll help me. And, and, and I, I'm, I've told many of you kids and children scare me. Uh, they really do. Uh, we do. We do VBS. And and uh, when, when I when I teach VBS or, or do anything with VBS, I really just have to forget all my pride. Forget all my, you know, just, just put it aside and deal with children. And it is hard. I, I just, those little eyes looking at me are scarier than your eyes. I don't know why. But if you're going to take a Sunday school class, you're going to need the Lord's help. I'm talking about Holy Ghost help. You'll need it. You'll need, and if you try to do it in your own strength, you're not doing those kids a favor and you're not doing yourself a favor either because the, the Spirit wants to empower you. 
Um, if you are trying to witness to a friend or maybe uh, sing in the choir, you know, we just kind of started our choir recently and, and I've, I've been noticing Brother Luke asking people to sing in the choir and there's trepidation there, right? We're going to get up in front of people and, and, and sing a, a joyful noise unto the Lord and, and there's nervousness, there's trepidation. But I'll tell you, if, if you allow the Holy Spirit, he'll, he'll empower you. He'll give you the courage and, and before long, those words will be coming out of your mouth and, and they'll sound good. And, uh, and he'll help us. So whatever it is, whether it's uh, um, serving the Lord in some area of the church uh, or on up to ministry, um, we need to understand that um, we, we need the Lord's help because we have limited power. And that's what uh, Paul is saying here in these verses. He's, he's explaining in verses three and four there um, that, that he was with them in weakness. I mean, this is what this is what Paul, he's saying, this is what I really was. I, I was a man. I was weak. I was in fear. I was in much uh, trembling, and uh, and I, I wasn't trying to use enticing words of man's wisdom, uh, assuming, uh, or basically him saying, you know, I didn't have that wisdom uh, to give. And so we have unlimited power. The job, the job is bigger than us, and we need to understand that, um, that when we get nervous about doing ministry, when we get nervous about serving in the church, when we get nervous about witnessing uh, to our neighbor or, or taking a stand, that, that nervousness is, is really just the symptom of what's really happening is that we're about to endeavor to do something that we need the Lord's help for. We can't do uh, on our own because we have limited power. However, the Holy Spirit gives us unlimited provision, uh, unlimited provision. So, so Paul knew and he understood, and we see that in verse 3 and 4, that, that the ministry was beyond his power. I mean, just think for a minute, and we do, I think, um, tend to put Paul on a pedestal at times, and, and we probably shouldn't. I mean, he wouldn't probably want us to, um, but, 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 but it's okay to have heroes in the faith, and we know that there are uh, biblical uh, people that we can, we can look to and, and learn from and model ourselves after. Um, but but he un can you imagine all the things that Paul did? There's no way he did that of his own power. There's no way he, I mean, we're trying to minister here, there's a, a group of us, we're trying to minister here in Gillette, this one, one city, Paul traveled his whole known world by foot and maybe camel. I don't know. He got all, I mean, he had intentions even to go all the way to Spain with the gospel. And that was, you know, nowadays you get on a plane, I can be in Spain tomorrow. But then it was, a, no, that's going to be a treacherous, long journey that you may or may not survive. He, he desired, I don't, I don't think he made it to Spain. I think he ended his ministry there in Rome, but um, but yeah, he went all the way to Italy, and, and, he, and in that whole Mediterranean area, he, he had, um, by the time he gave up the ghost, he had witnessed to, started churches in, and evangelized that whole area. I'm just telling you, he didn't do that in his own strength. He had to have the, uh, the provision of the Holy Spirit. And so he goes on in, these, in the scripture that we read here. He says, I didn't uh, do it with enticing words of man's wisdom, but notice what verse 4 says, middle of the verse, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He says, this is how this thing was accomplished, through the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So he makes it very clear, and he gives credit where credit's due. He says, it's not by you know, my wisdom, my strength, uh, my energy, my exuberance, my zeal. No, it was the, the Spirit of power. It was the Holy Spirit of God that did this work. And because the Holy Spirit of God did that work, now you uh, can stand not in the wisdom of men, but you can stand in the power of God. Someone said God's calling always comes with God's enabling. And that's true. He doesn't just promise to empower us, but also to enable us. If he leads you to witness to someone, he'll give you the courage and the words to say. Um, there, there's been a, many times where I um, uh, wanted to witness to a person, and, and you know how it is, um, you're talking to someone, everything's fine, and then the Holy Spirit says, hey, you should tell them about the Lord. I mean, all of a sudden, you go from being comfortable to being very uncomfortable, right? I mean, you do. You know, there's that feeling of nervousness that sets in, and, and I mean, it's just, I mean, fear of rejection. I, I don't know what all it is, but there's a little bit of nervousness. I'm gonna, they're going to think I'm strange, and and whatever that was, and or whatever that is, and so, um, but I, I've just I've just learned this: if you can get the first word out, the Holy Spirit just takes over. If you just get the first word out, I mean, it's amazing how you'll you'll just you'll just 
before long, the nervousness goes away and you're just talking about the Lord. You're just trying to tell someone else uh, exactly what you received, that you, you're not any longer on your way to hell because of what Jesus did for you. You're just sharing that and, it, and, and the, the Spirit just gives you the words in that time. If the Holy Spirit leads us to teach a class, I'm telling you, He'll enable you to do that and, and He'll enable you to, to communicate effectively. If, if the Holy Spirit get, uh, calls us to give, uh, he, will, he will enable us to have the provision to do so. The Lord doesn't say give and then He doesn't provide. No, He, he says give and then He does provide. Um, Paul, if you want to turn over to 2 Corinthians, he elaborates this uh, same thought in 2 Corinthians in chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verse 7. And a lot of stuff to get into right here. We're just going to really talk about what he's saying in verses 7 through 10. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power, of the power may be of God and not us. So, so notice this, he, he's, he's describing human frailty, earthen vessels. This, the, he's like, God's put this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? Well, that the excellency of the power may be of God and, and not of us. Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And so, this is Paul, the apostle. And he's saying... We have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's not in us. It's not by our strength. It will only be by the Lord's power that we're able to do the ministry. Um, <clears throat> he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and, and verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, and, uh, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor be nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. It's very similar to what Paul was saying when he was saying we have this treasure in earth in earthen vessels, we're perplexed, we're, we're persecuted. He's talking about when we enter into this spiritual warfare, we, when we enter into this uh, ministry of the, of the Spirit, we have to understand we're entering into it with an earthen vessel. But that earthen vessel has, ha, doesn't have the spirit of fear, but it has the spirit of God, the spirit of, of power and of love and of a sound mind, which enables us to do the work. Many of you know who Corey Ten Boom was. She said this, Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. So the Holy Spirit enables. Secondly, then, the Holy Spirit gives us boldness. <clears throat> and I think this is kind of what I was talking about. Um, if you just get that first word out. You say, well, I'm, I don't know. I'm just not too, I'm not a bold person. I'm not confrontational. Um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not confrontational at all. I hate confrontation. Like, who likes confrontation? If you like confrontation, you like confrontation? Some people, some people do like confrontation. I'm thankful, man. I, I, don't, I don't. I don't go looking for it. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to speak the truth when it's necessary. Um, so we have to understand that we may have a lack of confidence. Um, I want to read to you a verse. And you, you can turn there if you'd like. Acts 4.31 It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And so a, a fruit of the Holy Ghost, a, a result of the Spirit being in you is boldness. We, we understand that uh, we might have confidence issues, but the Holy Spirit does not have confidence issues. Does that make sense? I mean, we, we are the earthen vessel. He is not. So, so we may be, we are limited and we may not have confidence and so, so what would we do? Well, um, 
we tend to like to do those types of ministries that keep us from confrontation, right? We like That's kind of what we like. We'll be in the background. Uh, we always joke as Baptists that uh, you're not a true Baptist unless you stack chairs, you know, about twice a week or whatever. And... Uh, and so, you know, we, we, but we and, and by the way, those are, those are good and helpful. We need, we need those types of ministries. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit of God is in you, and He's wanting to speak. He's wanting to verbalize the gospel to those who are around you. And so, um, while we might not be confident, He is confident, and He will gift us courage. All right, so where do we get our courage? Well, it should be from, from the Holy Spirit. Um, by the way, that, that, that's important. It's important that we're not courageous in ourselves. It's, it's important that we're not, um, uh, that we're not uh, relying on our own abilities and our own, uh, our own wits, our own strength, but that our courage comes from Him. Um, but, but I do believe the Holy Spirit will give us courage. And then the Holy Spirit will say this, engages us. So may, maybe you're thinking, you know what? Okay, I realize I'm called. I'm saved. So uh, it's kind of it's hard to... Um, get around what the Bible says about those who are saved, that they're also called. It's just, so I'm there. And I understand the Spirit wants to do some work in my life. He wants to work on me. We've, we've gone through several of these lessons. He wants to work on me so that He can work on them. I mean, that's really the idea. He's going he's gonna to build me. He's going he's gonna to convict me. He's going to teach me. He's going to lead me, guide me. All those things that we've talked about. Why? So that we can then go and, and He can speak t- to others through us. And so, so, that, so that's kind of what he's doing there. Um, you may realize that, but you may say, well, how do I know what to do? Um, th- this is what's interesting. The Holy Spirit then, just be thankful. Even when you don't know what to do, he knows what to do. And if you're in tune with him, if you're walking I- in the Spirit and you're listening to him and you're studying the Bible and you're, and you're doing all those things that you know you're supposed to be doing, he will give you direction. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about his direction. The Holy Spirit directs us. Okay, now turn to the book of Acts. And we're going to look at uh, just, this is a a good example of Holy Spirit direction in um, Philip's life. So Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch heard the story, I'm sure. Acts 8. In verse 26. Oh, I'm in Acts 26. That is a different... I'm reading about King Agrippa, and I thought, that is not the right chapter. Let's go Acts 8 in 26. And I just, I just want to show you how this happens, because I think so many times we make following the Holy Spirit some really like hard to... Um, hard to do thing. That was really good wording there. Like, you know, well, he, here's what I'll tell you. The Holy Spirit's good at His job. I'll just tell you that. He's good at His job. He knows how to lead us. He knows how to direct us. Um, it's, it's usually our side. Well, not usually. It's always our. He's God, right? So it's always our side that's, that's like not getting the signals. But, but look, in, look at this, because I, I think this clarifies some of that, and then I'll, um, I'll maybe share a personal example. But Acts, 6, verse 20, Acts 8, sorry, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now pause for a second. I know those are very specific instructions, right? Here's the Holy Spirit. He's coming. And, and there's been times in my life where I've prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, could you just tell me, I mean, write it in the clouds, um, you know, what? I, send it in the mail. Just give me these exact specific instructions like you gave to Philip here. But it's not how it works these days, right? And the book of Acts um, is, a, is a transitional time of history. The Spirit was just uh, being, uh, had just been given to the Lord. The Lord's using these men to set in order the things that, that of course, we're, we're beneficiaries of now. But I'm telling you, the Spirit does direct just the same way. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll share how right now. So he got some very specific directions. Arise, go south, okay? 
go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, at this point, has he told Philip what he's supposed to do? No. He says, hey, uh, Philip, go south. It's kind of like when he came to, uh, uh, God came to, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he says, get thee out of thy country and, and from thy kindred unto the land that I will show thee. He doesn't even tell him where to go. He says, just start, just pack up your things, Abram, and, and just head out. Where'd I go? Oh, I'll show you. Just get walking. I mean, that's, is that not just as hard as kind of what we think is like, okay, the Spirit's directing. I mean, I know the Spirit wants to direct, but what is he going to say? What's he saying? What do I do? So Philip doesn't have all the answers. He has some specific direction, but he doesn't have all the answers. But here's the important point. Look at verse 27. And he arose and went. You see that? So he didn't question. He just said, okay, I know this. I know, I know in ver and he, he didn't have the, the ax in front of him, but we can see in verse 26, I, Philip says, I know that God wants me to do this. I don't know where he's taking me. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know how long I'll be there. But apparently I'm supposed to go south. That's not south. I'm supposed to go south. They're south over there. Um, he's, he, so he obeys. You know what happens when he obeys and gets down the road a ways? He gets a little more direction. All right, look at verse... Uh, uh, well, let's just keep reading that verse. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, and a Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to worship, to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. See that? So he so the first instruction was south. Just head south. Philip says, Okay. He starts heading south. He gets down there, and there's a chariot up ahead. And, and now the Spirit comes to him and says, hey, go over there and, and check out that chariot. See what's going on with that chariot. He gets in the, you know, just, I love to just, when I'm reading, I, this, I, have, I know what everyone looks like. When I get to heaven, they're all going to mess with me because I'll have an idea of what Paul and Timothy and Philip, I know what they all look like in my mind, and, and, um, but they're not going to look like that. Um, it's like when you listen to someone on the radio for a long time, and then you see them and you just can't believe that that's them. You know, it just, that's what's going to happen. But anyway, um, uh, he goes up to that chariot and he, and he knocks on the, I don't know if you knock on the door of a chariot, not, not real familiar with chariots, but he get somehow or another, he gets the attention of the Ethiopian eunuch in there. And, and maybe he overhears him reading Isaiah 53 through the window, if there's windows in those things. And, and he, and so he gets, and he, all of a sudden, it's made very clear to him what he's supposed to do. If you read the rest of the story, it's, it's made very clear. He says, understandest thou what thou readest? And the Ethiopian eunuch says, how, how can I accept some man? Show me, right? And, and so then Philip begins at the same scripture and preaches unto him Jesus. Remember the story? And, and so then Philip, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, after hearing Jesus, says, well, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And, and so what does the next verse say? It, it talks about, I don't want don't to misquote it here. Uh, wait, where was I at? Acts 26. 39, thank you. And when they were coming to the water, the Spirit of, uh, I'm sorry, verse 38. No, verse 37. Here, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. You know what Philip's saying? Don't get in the water before you believe. He's making sure you got to understand that, that you need to be saved, Ethiopian eunuch. You need Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. If you believe, then then I'll then I'll baptize you. He answered and said, the most important words this whole passage: I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He confessed, he was saved. Philip says, "Stop the chariot." He took him down there and he baptized him. Now, what I, what I'm telling you is this. Philip got some instruction from the Spirit, and he said, okay, yes, sir. And so he began to go that way. A little while longer, there, there's a chariot. He gets a little more instruction. He says, yes, sir. And so he goes over there to the chariot, and he starts talking. Before long, the Spirit's still leading and guiding, but before long, Philip knows exactly what to do. And he has this interaction with this Ethiopian man, and he leads him to the Lord, and he baptizes him. 
And then the coolest thing ever, he was caught away of the Spirit and just, just goes somewhere else, which would be really neat. You know, um, following the Holy Spirit, is that, it, that's how it is. He gives direction, um, but sometimes he gives it to us just a little piece at a time. And you ought to be thankful for that, because to be honest, we can't handle more than a little piece at a time. Um, I'll tell you this, whenever we uh, were called to preach, that's how it was. O over the course of several months, um, I was about 20 years old, might have been 19 when the Lord started, I, I don't remember, but I was 20 when I finally uh, surrendered to the call. But at, over a process of several months, the Lord just put this overwhelming desire in me to preach. It just I, I, You say, well, how do you know? I, I couldn't get away from it. It was just in me. It was just something I, I had an overwhelming burden, an overwhelming desire that uh, I just I just believe the Lord wants me to, to, to be in the ministry, to, to be a preacher. And, and so what that did is it drew me to his word more than I already was. And, and as I drew into his word more, um, the, the call became got stronger and, 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 and it got more prevalent and, and harder to go away. And and so, you know what I said? Not right away. But I said at some point, okay. And I was dating Tiffany at the time, and she thought I was going to be in uh, finance and making lots of money. And I've just made this decision halfway through college to not be in finance and not make lots of money and go into ministry instead. And so I'm thinking, now I have to tell her what I just told God I was going to do. And I was nervous. And, and I remember, I, I, there's a couple of, of dinners. I mean, I, I remember all dinners with Tiffany. All of them. All of them. I'll, I'll be at the altar later. Um, no, there's a couple I remember. I remember when I asked her to marry me. I was nervous. It was a, a whole thing. I'll, I'll share that with you later. But I remember this lunch after Sunday morning. You probably remember it too. The, the restaurant's not even there anymore. And I sat over there at that table and sobbed like a baby and told my hopefully soon-to-be wife that I think I need to be a preacher. God won't let me, uh, won't, let, won't let it go. And, and, and in some way, that was me saying yes to the Lord because I didn't want to, to go into ministry without her. And, you know, she started her sobbing as well, which made me feel good. And then she said, the Lord's been telling me the same thing. And right there, we made that decision. And, and so we said, okay. So you know what we did? We just started stepping through the next door. And as you step through the next door, the Holy Spirit just gives a little more instruction. And, and when he gives that little bit of instruction, you just say, okay, again. Yes, sir. And you step through the next door. And you continue to draw to him. You continue to, to pray. You continue to stay in the word. And, and he continues to just give you those little, you know, it's like those little, uh, what do they call it, little breadcrumbs to follow. Just a little bit more, you know, just a little more instruction. And as I look back on it, the call was incredibly clear. The direction was incredibly, is crystal clear. But it took just saying yes to the things that we knew. You know, there's some things today, God, or that you already know that God wants out of your life. There's some things today that you already know. I mean, um, there's 32,102 of them right here. That's how many verses are in your King James Bible. There's, that, that, there's, there's instruction right here. You already know this is God's will for your life. So if there's things in our life we're not living according to this, how do we, how do we expect then to hear any more from the Lord, right? If there's things that we know we're supposed to do and we're not doing them, do you think you're going to get that next bit of, of uh, direction. And I know I'm not talking about perfection and living. I mean, no one in this, in this world is living perfectly according to the scriptures. But there's things we know we need to be doing and we're not doing. But that's just, that's all I'm saying. There's things that in your growth process with the Lord, there's, there's steps he's wanting you to take that you haven't taken. And if you go and go ahead and take that step, I'll just tell you this, he'll empower you, enable you to do that, and then you'll receive the next bit of instruction. And so it's really not this, well, I got in the 
prayer room with God. He laid out my whole life before me. And I, I mean, maybe that's happened to somebody. It didn't happen that way to me. And I, I just see the, the process of following God is, is, is really, at least in my life, has been step by step. So here's, um, here's where the rubber meets the road. The Spirit leads always, and He always does a perfect job of leading. But let me tell you this, it does not mean that you don't have a free will. It does not mean that you don't have a decision in the matter. In fact, um, it's always your decision whether or not you'll follow the Holy Spirit. It's always your decision. On the day you got saved, it was your decision to, to, to confess your sins and believe in the Lord. Uh, today, if you were, are to, to please the Lord and, and, and walk with Him, it will be your decision. Uh, I can give you numerous examples, and I will as we move throughout this series. I'll give you numerous examples of how, um, how we have the ability to say no. Isn't the Bible full of examples of people who said no to God? I mean, it's full of them. It's, it's within us. It's our decision. So the question isn't, is he leading? No, he's leading. He's perfect at that. He's God. He leads. He's directing. And I'm telling you, he's, he's direct. we'll look at a couple things here. He's, he's directing you um, so that he can build you so that you can serve him and glorify him. The question is, are we making the decision to follow so the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, let's look at this one. The Holy Spirit unifies us. we got about five minutes left. I think we might can do it. <clears throat> By the Spirit's power. Now, if the Spirit could hold the clock every now and then, that would help a preacher. But um, The Holy Spirit unifies us. And I've, I've talked about this um, in other, we just went through Philippians, and when we went through Philippians chapter 2, we spent several weeks on uh, these exact things. So I won't spend a whole lot of time here, um, but he unifies us, and, and let me just throw the, the notes up here, in a called out assembly, which is the New Testament church, um, teams of believers, uh, groups of local called out assemblies uh, gathered and, and assembled for the purpose of accomplishing the Great Commission um, and serving the Lord in specific locations. Okay, so we're, we're Central Baptist Church here in Gillette, Wyoming. That is our called out assembly. And the Spirit unifies us to that calling, but He also uh, desires that we would have a unified body. And it's not that we all wear the same uh, shirt and tie or, or that we all have exact uh, beliefs, but we unify around the beliefs of the Scripture. Okay. So, so you might like Ford and I might like Chevy, um, but when it, and, and that's okay. But when it comes to the Scripture, we have to be unified. When it comes to the doctrine and the, 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 the prescription of, of the, the Lord to the church, we have to be unified. And that message is all throughout uh, the New Testament. And, and I already read Acts 4.31, which is talking about how the, the, they were uh, praying together in the Spirit and they spake with boldness. The next verse says, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. They were unified. And, and as you look at the book of Acts, um, you'll, you'll see that, that, that what the Lord does is he's continually, he's, uh, he, there's problems in the book of Acts, if you read. But he's continually dealing with those problems and bringing unity again around his word uh, over and over and over. And as I reference Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any bowels of mercies, there, there's, a, there's a yearning and a begging in these, these words where he says, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. And so the Spirit, one of the things that he does is he, he calls us into ministry, he enables us to do the, the work, he wants us to serve, but he, he, he put... He pushes us to the church and has us unified in the church so that we could uh, properly serve him. Um, the purpose of unity, and I, you just write down a few verses, write these down. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. 
Write down Romans 15.30 and Philippians 1.27. You can read those a little bit later. All those talk about the unity and what this, how the Spirit, one of the Spirit's main jobs is that He's wanting us to serve, but I'm telling you, if we're disunified, we can't serve. I mean, as a church, we, we, can't serve, we won't accomplish our purpose if we're not on the same page. And so the Spirit works to unify us. Um, and, and you need to get this. It's not unification just so we can all get along. I mean, that is a nice byproduct of unified, is that we do get along because we're in unity with one another. But unity, the purpose is so that we can accomplish what He wants us to do. I mean, if you're all rowing a boat and somebody turns the other way and starts rowing the other way, you're not going to get near as far, are you? Or if everybody just starts rowing off with one arm, even your arms have to be unified, you know? And so um, for, for us to really accomplish uh, what the Lord wants us to do, uh, we need to be unified. Now, lastly, the Holy Spirit exalts Christ. Always, always, always exalts Christ. Anytime I hear someone say, well... The, the, I know what the Bible says, but the Spirit told me. Do you understand how that is an issue? The Spirit will never disagree with the Word. They are one. They'll never disagree. So I, I always worry when someone says, well, I know, I know what the Bible says, but, but the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit always seeks to exalt Christ. Um, this was true. When Jesus was on earth, and got us a few uh, verses about that. John 15, 26, But when the Comforter is come, I will send whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16, 14, He shall glorify me. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus, Jesus accursed. And that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. As we saw um, uh, earlier, uh, it, it continues in these verses that this the Spirit will never conflict. He'll always seek to exalt the Lord. And then I already put up here, fulfilling His purpose. The Spirit will drive us to want to fulfill the Lord's purpose. Isn't it a little overwhelming? I'm, I'm going to, in the next, in, in, in church here in just a moment, I'm going to preach a, it's, it's kind of preaching. It's a lot of teaching this morning. It's why it's a little different. But I'm, I'm going to preach a message about the, uh, God's plan of discipleship for the church and how, um, how God has chosen us to carry out His work. And isn't that just a little bit overwhelming? Like, God, couldn't God do that much better? I mean, He is doing it. That he, He's doing it through, it's an amazing thing that He's chosen us to do His work. Um, but boy, we, we've got to do it in the power and the enabling and the presence and the leadership and the unity of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way uh, that it's accomplished. And so that's his serving ministry. We'll stop there, and uh, next week we'll pick up with our next lesson. Lord, I thank you for your word, and uh, Lord, it's uh, all that's here. I know the last couple of points we, we went pretty quick, but I just pray that, Father, your, uh, your spirit would have done its work this morning, and I pray he would continue to work in our hearts, help us today. Uh, Lord, be with us in all the services, and uh, we'll thank you for what you do. We love you, and we ask in Jesus' name, amen.